Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, uh, the webinar we're presenting today is sponsored by Celera, so thank you very much to Celera for uh, making this possible for everyone uh, for everyone to attend. The webinar is called "Are You Protecting the Clin uh, Protecting Clinical Engineering from Ransomware Attack?" We have uh, thought leaders, including clinical engineering executives, cybersecurity specialists. Uh, specialist CSOs and uh, doctors uh, who, who will provide us a, a diverse, thoughtful, and deep, uh, uh, deeply inter interesting panel discussion on preparedness for uh, for ARIUK, its impact on healthcare industry. We have the panelists today, and uh, about the panelists, we have uh, Richard Staining, who is a globally renowned thought leader, author, public speaker, and advocate for improved cybersecurity across the healthcare and life sciences industry. He has served on the Global HIMSS Privacy and Cybersecurity Committee and on the board of CHIME uh, AEHIS. Richard has advised numerous government and industry leaders on their healthcare security strategy and defensive post posture, as well as serving as a subject matter expert on government committees of inquiry into some of the highest profile healthcare breaches. He is also currently the chief security strategist for Silera, a pioneer in the space of medical device and HIOT security, and is editor of Cyber Thoughts. He also teaches postgrad cybersecurity courses at University College Denver and is a re retained advisor to a number of government and private companies. Uh, just a little bit about the logistics today. The, uh, we all should have uh, the microphones muted during the presentation. Questions to the panelists must be submitted via the Q&A feature in Zoom at any time. If there is any urgent issue, please use the chat feature to communicate with the panelists. And please remember to complete the webinar evaluation after attending. A link will be provided at the end. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Saif Abed. He is a medical doctor and healthcare cybersecurity and national, uh, national security expert. His primary fields of spe uh, specialization are cybersecurity, cyber warfare, and crime targeting hospitals and safety critical infrastructure. Based in London, Dr. Abed is a partner of uh, partner and director of cybersecurity services uh, at the clinical security advisory and technology firm, the Abed Gra uh, Graham Group, and holds additional independent expert roles for the European Commission, World Health Organization, and UK Infrastructure and Projects Authority. Academically, he holds degrees in medicine, uh, St. George's Hospital Medical School, University of London, and management at uh, Cambridge University, and software and system security with Oxford University. Our next speaker is uh, Tracy Hughes, who is the Senior Director of Clinical Engineering at Duke Health Technology Solutions. Her leadership, clinical engineering, and healthcare technology expertise spans more than 30 years. She spent the first 20 years of her career with Aramark Healthcare, uh, having achieved the position of Vice President of Operations for Clinical Technology Services. Her current responsibilities with Duke Health include oversight of the Clinical Engineering Management Program, with oversight of over 55,000 active medical devices, as well as working closely with ISO, compliance, and supply chain on cybersecurity surrounding medical devices. Tracy has earned a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering degree from Tulane University and a Master's of Management in Clinical Informatics degree from Duke University School of Medicine. And our last uh, speaker is uh, <coughs> Pablo Rincon, who is based in, in, in Madrid and is VP of Cybersecurity at uh, Cilera Labs specializing in medical device protection and vulnerability management. He is an authority in the space of cyber threat intelligence, highly specialized in healthcare APTs like Orange Worm, being first to spot the relation of Quampiers with uh, Shamoon APT, and has presented some of his findings at security conferences all over the world. Before joining Cilera, uh, the uh, Cilera team, Pablo worked for companies such as Alienvolt, Emerging Threat, Qualys, uh, Bugaroo, his own startup and Suricata, and has participated in the design and development of a wide range of security solutions, uh, C, uh, SIEM, IPS, WAF, digital sur surveillance, and early security system, early warning systems, uh, vulnerability management, and information leak prevention systems. He has also collaborated in incident response, forensics, and malware analysis for IBEX 35 companies. And uh, with that, I want to hand it over to our speakers. Thank you again very much for presenting and for uh, helping us uh, make, uh, to, for, for helping raise awareness uh, of the cybersecurity threat to the clinical engineering community. Uh, 
Uh, Richard, you're on mute. Yep, I just discovered that all these technologists who can't <laughs> find a mute button. Thank you very much, Alir, for, uh, for your introduction there. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, Ryuk and uh, the plague that, uh, you know, is uh, is impacting uh, UK, uh, US healthcare. Uh, and I'm sure many of you will be fully aware that uh, there was a briefing a few weeks back uh, by CISA, uh, the uh, FBI and HHS, warning uh, healthcare delivery organizations of uh, a pending uptick um, in ransomware activity uh, targeting the healthcare uh, public uh, health sector. Um, and uh, this has caused uh, considerable alarm. And that's one of the reasons why we elected to put this uh, session on today. Um, it's going to be partly discussion based and partly briefing based. But first, I thought it would be beneficial uh, for uh, us to receive a briefing on Ryuk. What is Ryuk? What does it uh, evolve? What are its attack vectors? Um, so that we can uh, we can use that for uh, discussion purposes later on. So first, I'd like to hand the uh, the gauntlet uh, to uh, to uh, my next uh, one of our panelists here today uh, by uh, by the name of Pablo Rincon from Madrid, um, who is a uh, an expert um, on the uh, on the riot ransomware, and uh, wanted him to share some of his uh, thoughts and his research um, into this. So over to you, Elia. Uh, over to you, uh, uh, Pablo. All right, thank you. Uh, so first of all, uh, I would like to make an introduction of uh, why ransomware threats are uh, predominant uh, right now. As you know, ransomware is a kind of cyber extortion uh, used for, um, by cyber criminals just for profit, for money. In the last uh, three to five years, uh, it has become uh, the most usual uh, strategy used by them. Uh, Ryuk has a precursor called Hermes. This uh, tool was developed by a group called uh, CryptoTech. Hermes is a ransomware as a, was, uh, was sold as a ransomware as a service uh, for $300. Uh, the second version, uh, version 2.1 of Hermes is what we call uh, Ryuk. As of today, attribution is still unclear. So the criminals use it for profit and many researchers believe that Ryuk actors have ties with TrickBot. Uh, TrickBot is being a mal uh, banking malware. Uh, uh, some names of the yeah, uh, here you can see a screenshot of how they announced this uh, tool. They sell it, they were selling it compiled and ready to use uh, with uh, an email address for contacting uh, the attackers and with a Bitcoin address or other type of um, crypto coin to pay the rescue of the, of the files. So uh, how does it work? How does the real kill chain uh, work? Simplifying the stages, you first have an initial infection vector, then uh, attackers will do a reconnaissance of the network and the, and the scope that they achieve with the intrusion, and then they will deliver the right payload. The usual chain is uh, lure documents, malware documents, sent by uh, with phishing, for example, and then a uh, type of uh, dropper like Emotet, but not limited to that, uh, then TrickBot and uh, Cobalt Strike as a post-exploitation framework, and at last, Ryuk. So here you can see an example of a document used by them uh, as an initial uh, infection uh, vector. They send uh, an email with the subject termination list. So any employee uh, will be curious to see if uh, they will get fired or if their partners will get fired, etc. Uh, as you can see, there they also use uh, links to legitimate uh, places like Google Docs. So you gotta be careful with what you receive and you gotta check the, uh, and verify the sender. Next one. 
Another example here uh, is a, an email announcing free COVID-19 testing. Uh, so they also use this uh, type of subjects, uh, usually subjects that are in the news every day. Next one. So the initial infection vector uh, is this uh, lure document uh, sent by spear fishing campaigns. They drop emoter, emoted buzzard, buzzard loader via PowerShell scripts and then trickbot. But sometimes they use uh, set, lo set loader or set bot. Uh, devices and services exposed to internet are also an infection uh, uh, point, an, an entry point uh, for the intrusion. Vulnerable devices and workstations, uh, like, like for example, using uh, vulnerabilities like uh, BlueKeep or Serologon are usually exploited by them. Uh, they also use uh, the fault or easy to use credentials on, on services like SSH, remote desktop, FTP, and other type of common services. Uh, you gotta keep in mind that also that credentials uh, of victims are sold in the underground in all this um, ecosystem of cyber criminals uh, and they can get a ROI of it. Uh, they can buy a credential for thousands of dollars and make a lot more of, of, of money. Sometimes they ask for the 10% of the uh, income gross annual income growth uh, of a company as the, uh, as the rescue amount. Next one. Yeah, this one was crossed, but uh, you, you can see uh, how funny they, they are. They say non-profit organization, obviously, <laughs> they want profit. Uh, this is a, an example of a, of a malware document. It will usually ask you to enable editing, enable content, enable uh, macros in order to be able to execute PowerShell scripts or Visual Basic scripts that will drop the emotet loader. So next, uh, they do a reconnaissance um, stage where they see uh, what domains are linked uh, to this one and they try to gather all the domain credentials they can, uh, as well as uh, identify valuable targets, uh, depending on the industry. For example, with healthcare, we know EMR, uh, PAX servers uh, are very valuable to them. But point of sales are interesting as well. And uh, any kind of device uh, collecting inf personal information use it for filling forms is interesting for them as well. Uh, it's also interesting databases, uh, whatever that can break the business continuity uh, and also um, browser credentials of the users because sometimes uh, the, the, the users of the network, networks are connecting to banking web pages, leaving their credentials that they can uh, keep using or selling in these underground forums. Uh, so in order to achieve this uh, reconnaissance uh, and lateral movements, uh, they will usually um, use TrickBot with modules and uh, as well as Cobalt Strike, that is a post-exploitation framework that allows you to pivot on different uh, servers. They will try to get access to the Active Directory information uh, using tools like Minicats, uh, Sharkhound, Rubius, AD Find, but also uh, not only these malicious tools, but also legit tools uh, like uh, Double DMI, PowerShell, PSXEC. They will uh, change the ICL limits, they will use uh, PuTTY, other types uh, of tools, and they tend to uh, renovate their tools and change their tactics from time to time because uh, they know um, uh, people is looking at those IOCs, at those uh, fingerprints that they can uh, track. 
uh, after all of this uh, reconnaissance step, they have a bunch of credentials and they can achieve a lot of damage uh, to spread um, spreading Ryuk. So they will distribute it often with RDP, remote desktop protocol using clipboard transfers, but also Windows shell folders, uh, PowerShell sch uh, scheduled jobs uh, to execute them. And uh, they can even use uh, Windows GPOs. Uh, they will also remove backups, disable them, disable shadow copies, disable uh, antiviruses. Uh, if they can do it uh, from a, cent a central uh, station, they will do. And then they will uh, drop Ryuk. And Ryuk will try to wake, on, uh, wake up devices that are in standby by sending wake on LAN packets. It will also try to ping and scan the network to see uh, responding uh, IPs. And it will try to mount these uh, unique drives as Windows uh, drives to infect them, to, in, to encrypt their files, to encrypt their files. And uh, all of these will be achieved by launching uh, multiple uh, different execution threads. Next one. These threads uh, will use uh, an, AIS, an AIS, uh key to encrypt the files and then uh, it will use an RSA key that is embedded in this uh, Ryuk file uh, to encrypt also the keys used by all those uh, different threads. Uh, so at the end, you will have uh, all those files encrypted and with the extension uh, RIC. Uh, and a node will be displayed uh, with instructions of how to, of how to uh, recover from the attack. And it's usually to uh, do a payment to a Bitcoin address or other type of, uh, of crypto coin, but it's usually Bitcoin. You can see here an example uh, of a node uh, that they uh, use. They tell you, do not uh, reset do not, or shut down the computers. And that's not true. Uh, usually one of the tips that that is said is to power off as soon as possible whatever you can power off uh, to stop the spread. This one, they also have this other uh, type of node, a bit more like mystic balance of the shadow universe. Next. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for that, that briefing, Pablo. A lot of detailed information there and we'll make those slides available. Um, to uh, to attendees of the uh, the webinar today, because I think there's probably some some good takeaway uh, lessons there. The first uh, thing I wanted to to ask the, my panel here today is why is ransomware like uh, Ryuk uh, so dangerous to healthcare? And perhaps we can start with a clinician's perspective, Doctor Abed. Uh, you know, uh, wh why is ransomware so dangerous to to patient care and to uh, the functioning of uh, healthcare delivery organisations? So it's, it's a really interesting point because the way you have to consider ransomware is not just in terms of the immediate impact it has in terms of making a specific set of patient data unavailable. The way a hospital functions, there are so many interdependencies of the workflows. One attack that appears quite focused can have ramifications to the entire operations of a hospital. So just a, a classic one, if, you, if you'll humor me for a moment. Um, I often hear the hypothetical scenario of a CT scanner being rendered unavailable or a radiology department or whatnot. And people then tend to focus on, okay, that, you know, that's bad, but why is that? Well, it's because radiology is a linchpin of diagnostics in the hospital. Patient flow from the ER to the operating room, to the ICU, discharging patients could be dependent on imaging. So you could target a specific part of the network, a part of the uh, hospital's operations, and the risks and ramifications are far larger than what you originally expect. Even innocuous things, such as an arterial blood gas machine. I used to work in, uh, in my junior doctor days in ICU and in general surgery. We were dependent on arterial blood gas machines so much, and a lot of people wouldn't expect surgery is dependent on a ABG machine. So there are so many intricacies and interdependencies and in workflows that makes even a focused ransomware attack, if you can describe such a thing, um, really catastrophic in, in nature, potentially. Okay. I, I want to ask the same question to Tracy, but from a clinical engineer's perspective. So 
um, why is ransomware so uh, uh, so dangerous to uh, to clinical engineering and biomedical uh, facilities in a hospital? Well, in general, and kind of speaking to this community, uh, you're going to be aware that medical devices, a lot of them, you're you're taking a look at things that have a lifespan of seven to ten years, and so we find that first and foremost, you're not able to uh, install a lot of endpoint security um, on these medical devices. Second, you'll find that a lot of them have embedded or older operating systems. And so that makes them more vulnerable just inherently. And then when you're talking about if a, if a, if a REOC attack happened, and, and again, that CT that you just mentioned, you know, you're, you're talking about besides the impact on the organization as a whole, you've got this piece of equipment that you paid, you know, million dollars to have a, a lab done, and now it's down. Um, and that's not the kind of thing that you turn around tomorrow and you're installing a new one. So, you know, besides, you know, the, the rest of the facility may have recovered from it, but you're still kind of faced with this piece of equipment that's um, down, you know, and understanding how you're going to have to treat it. And so I think you see that kind of across across the board um, just with that with that downtime associated with the individual devices. Yeah, and, and you know, technology like medical devices are now part of the critical path of any hospital, as, as Dr. Abed said, right? It's part of, it's an integral part of clinical workflows. Um, and uh, as you said, a lot of these devices are legacy. They're old, they don't go away. Um, I like to talk about medical devices having the half-life of plutonium. You never seem to be able to get rid of them if they still function in a hospital. It's a very difficult argument to have with a, uh, with a hospital CFO to say, we need to replace all of these perfectly working devices because they're, you know, 10, 7, 15 years old in some cases, right? Well, and, and in particular, now you're faced with um, hospitals that had to shut down a lot of elective surgeries for portions. So a lot of um, facilities are facing financial challenges anyway. Um, so the money that's available to replace, you know, capital equipment or to invest in or, you know, to address for these types of things is, is even slimmer. You know? Exactly, exactly. It's, a, it's an even tougher argument to have in 2020 than it was in 2019. So uh, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So my next question is, how do you know when you've been hit with RIOC? What are the, um, what we call the IOCs, the indicators of, of compromise? Pablo, perhaps you could start us off on this one. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, in order to really uh, track um, if you are being, uh, if, if you are affected by RIOC, you should be using uh, real IOC feeds uh, with subscriptions uh, and be constantly reviewing reports because as they are a red team, they are switching their uh, tools, tactics, their infrastructure constantly. Uh, so I will uh, invite you to review the US third uh, IOCs that are already uh, released. Uh, but I will uh, mention just a few, a high level. Uh, the most obvious one is if you find files in your computer with the RIC extension means that your computer is already compromised. Mm -hmm. uh, then at the network level, uh, you would look to uh, ex external IPs uh, requests of HTTP without domain names or with domain names with uh, cheap TLD uh, top level domains uh, like .bazar, .xyz, .jo. There are many. Uh, and they, uh, they can also have random strings like this one that I'm uh, sharing. Uh, I will show more examples in the next slide. Uh, but you can also look for um, out of hour connections, anomalous traffic. For this, you need to know your traffic. You need to profile your traffic and know what is, uh, what is useful and what, and what is not. Uh, RDP connections, also internal, uh, SSH connections, also internal, not, not only external, because they use it for, uh, to um, do lateral movements. Uh, here you have uh, some examples of URLs, uh, real URLs used by them. Uh, first ones are belong to a Motet dropper. And you can see um, they use uh, strings that look like uh, random, really strange ones. Then you have the TreatBot URLs that they will have a, a first directory, for example, more 137, that is 
uh, what in Tripod is called Jitter. And then uh, something that looks like the name of a PC because they will be leaking this information and uh, other uh, strings like this. Then if you see HTTP requests with the word gate uh, for the scripts like, like gate.php or gate with some random strings or cp.php as of control panel, you should trigger a review on those. Uh, as well, they will, uh, if, if Rayuk is in the network, it will be using Wacom LAN packets and it will be scanning with ping uh, to see what um, hosts can be uh, queried via um, Windows shares, Windows uh, shared folders. Right. So in other words, we need a combination of, you know, monitoring DNS, right, uh, outbound DNS requests to make sure that we're not going to newly uh, or newly generated uh, machine algorithm DNS names um, or to uh, you know, high risk uh, DNS or uh, high NS DNS domain names or to known C2 servers, right? Command and control servers. Uh, we also need to look at outbound traffic to see what's leaving our network. And we need to look at internal traffic to see if there's any anomalous behavior going on you know, using Wake on LAN, for example. So uh, these are you know, very good things and we'll provide these slides with you. So. Um, my next question is, uh, is what should clinical engineers do today, right? Being prepared is, is more than just being a Boy Scout motto. So what, what can we do to prepare for the advent of, of ransomware uh, and attack vectors like Rio? Hey, um, so I think it, it all starts again with inventory. Uh, that's the backbone of the HTM world is, is inventory, it, but it's expanding it to make sure that your inventory includes IT attributes that a traditional HTM inventory does not. IP, MAC address, your OS, patching level, endpoint security, what you have. You want to make sure that you're working with procurement to include language um, regarding a software bill of materials, uh, patching, you know, those types of things in any purchases that you have going forward. You know, again, this, this Rio has already kind of presented itself, but that doesn't mean the work doesn't stop and then and the next thing is kind of following right behind it. Um, I think you, uh, all organizations, and I'll stress this uh, at, without being an ad for any particular one, but evaluate passive discovery tools that are available to assist with overall visibility and transparency in medical devices. Um, what happens, and again, as I mentioned earlier, without being able to install some of those endpoint agents on there, um, our IT world, our, our folks in that, in that space may see these things but not have the ability to understand kind of what they are. So uh, these tools help us with that inventory, putting them in the classifications, giving more visibility, uh, assigning risk management, and then most importantly, I think for us, it's the prioritization of the work effort, you know, really once you have all that and it's visible, then where do you spend your time given whatever the, the threat may be? Um, I encourage folks to do a proof of concept and go back through. I think you should look at um, now more than ever, <laughs> some, I, some CE departments report up through IT, but work with your IT teams. Help them with profiling of medical devices, set up a lab in your shops, um, work with them on recommendations for policy regarding communication between devices. What devices should be talking to other devices within your organization? So that'll help them whenever there's anything that's anomalous to that, you know, that's happening. Understand vulnerabilities that impact medical devices with, with focus again on those critical vulnerabilities. It's segmentation, um, how you see it within the CMDB. Work with your manufacturers. A lot of these um, manufacturers, the large ones, have uh, security sites to, dedicated to security. Um, they're the latest threats within their install base, kind of what's available. Build the relationships with your local support team. So if something happens, you've got them ready um, to assist. Remind manufacturers that that remote access that we talked about may need to be turned off or limited during threat. And if you have contracts, make sure you're including the language about the patching and remaining current on OS. Next slide. Um, this is something that was interesting. So especially as we looked at the Rio, um, make sure, you know, look beyond the traditional scope of HTM and make sure your organization is aware of equipment that's not traditionally included in medical equipment inventories. So for example, here, one of the things that we found that was kind of a gap was our Pixis OmniCell workstations, right? Um, they don't typically land in one of those. And again, they've got that same software level. 
uh, work with our clinical leadership on response, containment, and, and recovery. So if something happens, you know, kind of work through that in advance. What, what is your approach going to be? Make sure that you're aware of resources that are available out there. I put a couple of them that are out here that are really, really great and share within our HTM community, much like we're doing today, um, so that we can all learn um, as others experience. Yeah, very, very, very good points. Thank you for sharing that, Tracy. And, you know, just as a reminder, preparation is a lot, lot cheaper than incident response after an event. So um, it's a hard argument to have, particularly with uh, with hospital CFOs sometimes. Uh, but uh, preparation is is key. And I guess that's why we're all little Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts in, in this case. Thank you, Tracy. Um, my next question is, uh, how should we coordinate with clinical leaders, particularly, you know, CMIOs, for example, to improve security posture? I'm going to direct that one to Dr. Aved. Yeah, this, this is a great question for a, a number of reasons. One, I used to be that annoying clinician who would uh, maybe, <laughs> I'm still annoying, yeah, who, who would debate with my uh, IT and security colleagues and then over the last decade, I've been the bridge between <laughs> often those two sides. The question really is, it's like with, you know, practicing medicine, prevention is cheaper than administering the cure. And so in that scenario, though, if you go in using overtly technical language with busy clinicians who have a busy day, a busy ER, a busy operating room, busy radiology department, and you want to change their equipment or you want to intervene in the way they operate in order to you know, update equipment or apply some security controls, whatever it may be, then that requires a constructive relation. You need to be working together so that both sides understand why this needs to happen. Clinicians need to understand what are the ramifications for their department, for their organization, if things do go wrong because of a cyber attack. What does it mean for their ability to deliver patient care to their existing patients and potentially new patients? Um, and that's really important. And on the flip side, um, from the technical side, security leadership needs to understand the concerns of clinicians around kind of what they see is interfering potentially in their environment. Now, um, what I see, obviously the rise of the CMIO, the CNIO, these are your allies. These are the people who've already raised their hand and said, I wanna be that interface. They could be a, a tremendous uh, evangelist for you. So in order to get through your uh, security strategy, in order to get investment for security as well, you know, these colleagues can often uh, have an ear at the board level, you know, through their connections if they're not up there. Um, really alter your language. Um, we're gonna get to in a slide in a minute about how we quantify risk from a clinical perspective. And that's a key way to engaging with clinical leadership as well. But I think take, having an understanding more enriched communication is critical to achieving your security agenda. And I, I hope, you know, that uh, in future people like me can work with people like Tracy in a, in a really positive and enjoyable manner rather than the legacy historical way of 20, 30 years ago, where it's kind of butting heads between the two sides. Right, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. So uh, an open question to the panel, how, uh, or sorry, what can or should you do to prevent a real attack? Any takers? Uh, my first advice is to uh, monitor, obviously, to improve your security in general. Uh, this is a, uh, you gotta think that Ryuk is not, uh, Ryuk is just a ransomware, but there are many. And Ryuk is used by a red team. And this red team, as a red team, is not, is going to be switching its tactics and, and tools. Uh, because the day a red team uh, get used to the same tools and the same procedures, they are done. They will be detected and, and they won't achieve their goals. Uh, so um, for Ryuk and for the long term, uh, you just got to improve your security in all aspects. Uh, for starting from host security, antiviruses, EDR solutions, um, continuing with uh, network monitoring, network traffic monitoring, micro segmentation, uh, training to employees to avoid them uh, getting social engineered uh, to prevent these lure documents uh, from phishing campaigns. Uh, in general, improve your security is my advice. Right, right. Yeah, uh, a lot of the, uh, the ransomware attacks that we've seen over the last five years have been the simple fact of lack of security housekeeping, right? Lack of patching or 
untimely patching um, of devices. And obviously in a biomedical environment, it's difficult to patch devices uh, in a timely manner uh, when uh, you know vulnerabilities are discovered because vendors don't make those patches available. So we need to look at compensating security controls, as you said, things like micro segmentation, right, or uh, increased enhanced alerting of systems. But um, you know the the importance of security awareness um, is is phenomenal, right? Ninety percent of ransomware attacks start with a phishing attack according to more than more than one survey in this particular space. So, you know, the human is the weak link, as it were. So, yeah. So keep your uh, keep your staff trained and keep your patches applied and make sure that you've got the basic uh, security uh, uh, in, in place for, uh, for those for your environment. Good. Uh, I want to move on to, you know, in furtherance of that question, I want to move on talking about, you know, PAC, NAC, uh, network access, uh, quarantine. Um, but First, we really need to understand our risks, right? So beyond well-known metrics like CVSS, how do we quantify and uh, qualify patient safety and clinical service risk? And I think, Dr. Abed, if you could lead with this one, I think you, you may have some insights there. Yeah, I mean, first thing I wanna raise, as much as I do uh, plenty of work in the US these days, I come from a public sector environment. I come from a, a national health system. We are cash strapped, we are resource limited. So we can, you can deploy solutions um, and identify all the endpoints in your enterprise. You can identify thousands upon thousands of vulnerabilities, but at some point, someone's gonna have to make a call. Where do we point our resources to get the biggest bang for buck to protect our enterprise and to protect patient safety? So the way I've looked at things is that we have to move beyond just technical uh, assessment metrics like CVSS as helpful as, as they are and start to apply context in terms of how we measure risk. So um, I use four themes, clinical, organizational, financial, and regulatory risk, where basically we can look at our you know, CT scanner example, our arterial blood gas uh, example, and we can say, okay, if this device fails, not only is there a risk to its immediate workflow, but we need to measure and understand and profile all the workflows within the hospital that are dependent on this as a bottleneck. By having that kind of approach, you don't only understand the immediate risk to uh, patient safety that in the vicinity of that um, endpoint, you understand the indirect scalable harm that can happen to patients across an environment because of delayed care, delayed diagnostics, delayed management, delayed communication. And you can then derive from that even more of a focused understanding of the potential losses of revenue, the uh, potential scale of recovery costs, and then of course, reputational damage is an extension of that. I find that one is really interesting at the, at the C-suite level uh, actually by, by extension. But by taking that kind of approach and going through an exercise, which doesn't have to be painful actually, there are different ways to do it, but I won't get into that today. By taking that kind of a thematic approach that steps a bit beyond what CVSS does while still considering it, uh, I think it could be a really powerful way to help you decide, okay, we want to apply pa patching or a whole bunch of compensating controls, but this is what we're gonna prioritize because of this more holistic view of risk. And I think that's, um, I think that's something we can all get behind, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. And, and risk is really the business justification for you know, increased uh, or improved security programs, right? You can't justify you know, uh, large spends on new tools and uh, advanced training uh, without understanding why, where you're spending your money and justifying that, right? So. Well, and, and ju just to stick with the medical analogy about prevention being better than cure, you know, what I've just des described may be a bit alien to some people saying, look, that takes a, a lot of effort. It doesn't have to. It's kind of like um, you want to improve your diet. You want to do a bit more exercise. You start with baby steps, you know, maybe you do a go for a walk uh, in a day, start removing some carbs from your diet or whatever it may be until you build up to a really good diet and exercise regimen. It's the same thing with ad addressing risk holistically. Before you know it, you're healthier than you've ever been before. Right, and I think we could all do with a bit of exercise after uh, you know, our COVID pounds, uh, putting on some COVID pounds this year, working, uh, working from our uh, homes and pushing them out around the desk. So uh, yeah, good, good point. So um, let's also talk about the importance of leadership. Why is, why is getting leadership on board so critical to preventing ransomware attacks on hospitals? And you know, why, uh, why is it that uh, when an organization doesn't have the, uh, a, a culture of cybersecurity established across the organization and the active support of its leaders that it, it generally flounders? These are the hospitals that are being hit by ransomware most prevalently. Um, you know, 
what's what's the reason for that? That's an open question to the panel. See, when I say open question, everyone stays on mute. So I should direct it. Dr. Abed, I know you and I have spoken about the importance of leadership before. So give me, share your thoughts on this. Well, I mean, not to sound like a cynic, but as a typical clinician, I have to be sometimes. You can't really get security done the way we want it done without the money. And so uh, we need leadership on board, understanding that security isn't just a technical silo. It is longitudinally important to the function of the enterprise. Um, and it can be measured in all the ways we've described before, patient outcomes and whatnot. And so having leadership that can communicate that at that level, but also having leadership at that level that recognizes what's being explained to them or are willing to be educated um, is a recipe for success. But without that, you know, um, hospitals are, you know, struggling financially in a lot of parts of the world. Uh, it can be difficult without having those um, open lines of communication. Right. Uh, and Tracy, how, how, how are you coping with, you know, leadership support of your program at Duke? Yeah, so I, I, think it, I think it is really, really important because especially during, you know, this latest threat, you, the hospital, by laying out the groundwork, the impact that you have um, from this, this particular threat, you know, we were able to recommend um, decisions about not allowing access to personal emails or turning off Facebook, things that, you know, again, from a... Um, you know, aren't, aren't too, uh, too uh, good to kind of come back to employees that are like, hey, I want to, you know, kind of get to these things. But if you build that relationship with them, if you're telling them about the importance, if you, if you are building, you know, having that case for it, then they, then you've got their support and that leadership and that comes across the group. And it makes when you have to make those kind of decisions and roll out something like that, it, it goes so much smoother. Um, and it's not an us and a them, but it's something that's come across as the organization is doing, you know, to to protect itself. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We need to we need to act as one from the top all the way down throughout permeating throughout every level of the organization so, in order to ensure security. Um, I just looked at the Q&A. We're coming up uh, on uh, on a quarter till the hour. So I wanted to allow some time for questions. So if the audience uh, does have questions and they would like to raise them, please uh, whack those into the Q&A button on your, uh, on your webinar meeting here and we will uh, attempt to answer uh, those uh, as, we, uh, as we move forward. Um, I want to, to kind of move on to um, some takeaway tips here for, uh, for attendees on uh, final survival tips. Uh, Pablo, uh, as, our, as our threat expert here, do you want to uh, walk us through some of, uh, some of your suggestions here for, uh, for how to survive a, a real attack. Yeah, yeah uh, so the tips, uh, event monitoring, uh, security operation centers, uh, managed se uh, security services uh, product providers, uh, having um, event management, um, using IOC feeds, uh, this is a must for corporate network networks right now, uh, as well as for healthcare. Uh, so network monitoring, especially on devices where you can't install things on, uh, is uh, fundamental. Uh, as well as uh, active directory event monitoring. Then uh, micro segmentation, NAC, uh, firewalling. Uh, there are many things, many uh, communications that, that doesn't need to be in hospitals uh, in the, because they are not needed in the, in the uh, clinical workflows or, or in the business uh, continuity. Oh, um, uh, something uh, really uh, important is avoid at all cost using default credentials, uh, because if they use default credentials and they find them, uh, they will spread much faster. Uh, so default credentials or master passwords, totally forbidden. If there are an antivirus uh, solutions uh, on workstations on, on, on devices where you can install things, uh, have an offline backups, not, not only online backups, because they will try to find them uh, they, it's also a, a valuable target for them because uh, if, uh, it's part of their, their goal to, um, 
to take out this information. And then uh, periodically make audits, uh, do routine, uh, routine purple team exercises. And if you uh, can, if, if your batch allows you, uh, do adversary emulation. Right, right. Absolutely. And, you know, a number of hospitals have been hit because their backups were taken down, right? And they've been forced to pay the ransomware or, um, <clears throat> you know, go out of business, essentially. And we've read a lot about, you know, small physician practices and dental practices that uh, have not been able to recover because they had one backup and it was online and uh, it was connected and the ransomware got to it. But, you know, in, in all honesty, these guys, you know, the perpetrators of these cyber crimes are in it for the long run, right? They sit and they watch for hours and days. A uh, month, it's, interesting. Right? it's interesting because it, uh, the, the evolution is not like that. The evolution is that they are trying to speed up as much as possible. They're trying to be uh, as fast as possible uh, because they know they, they get into the risk of being detected. So all their, op all their operation um, can fail. So they are starting to be uh, as fast as doing a whole, uh, the three stages that I have explained uh, in the briefing in just two hours. The last one was just uh, two hours. Wow. Yeah, very fast. I think you got a few more uh, survival tips here, right? So. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, more specific to healthcare. Uh, next one. Uh, yeah. So as I said, uh, and they started uh, being for months, hiding in the networks, uh, monitoring, trying to identify valuable targets, uh, etc. But that uh, eventually changed to days, then to hours, and the last attacks were like just two hours, uh, pretty fast. So I would say uh, prepare a contingency uh, plan for proactive resilience. What happens when uh, you have an intrusion and a, a lot of workstations and devices are broken? Uh, you gotta do uh, you gotta be ready for selective quarantining. You gotta know what you can power off, what you can unplug, what, what you can't, and also uh, what shouldn't be affected because not all the devices are affected by, uh, by this um, malware. You gotta find a balance for the uh, short mid term. What happens the next days? If you are using all your infusion pumps, for example, and they are vulnerable, uh, you might uh, be uh, out of using any of them the next day. So maybe you gotta uh, try to have some um, for backups for business continuity and clinical continuity. Uh, then prepare also a process for recovering. How are you going to um, start powering things on? How are you going to uh, be res restoring these backups and making sure they don't get hit again? You need a plan to uh, restore everything. So it's an iterative process ordered hands-on with people looking at things, at indicators to see if you can continue or, or if you have to roll back. It's not just to deploy a vacuum. And uh, what is critical for patient safety and for business continuity? You gotta uh, make these questions for the next days of an intrusion. How, how can you uh, continue with it? And uh, you gotta make sure to um, um, assign responsibilities. There, there's people that need, need to lead these uh, operations and they need to uh, find other people responsible uh, for taking this plan uh, to reality. And as well, uh, communication is pretty important. As uh, Saif said, uh, rep reputational damage is also a thing. So you gotta uh, see how to coordinate communication with the, with the media uh, and, in the, and the internal workflows. And uh, fi the final uh, slide. Train your team. Your team uh, can, can be uh, attacked with uh, social engineering attacks, with these malware documents, spare phishing campaigns. Uh, so they gotta um, validate and verify the senders of the emails they, they receive and not open anything 
uh, even if they if it looks uh, COVID related or um, ter a termination list of employees, uh, be careful with uh, with the bring your own device. Uh, what devices are getting plugged and, and where inside the uh, network of, of, of the hospital? Don't use your personal email at work. And, and actually, if you don't need to, don't use uh, corporate email on devices where you don't need to, because you are taking them uh, into the risk. <clears throat> don't open emails uh, with attachments or links uh, if you don't validate the senders. And uh, for common workstations, as uh, many of the systems, um, something uh, common uh, is to plug them off. If you, if you are sure you can plug them off, uh, no doubt, plug them off because uh, it can stop the, the threat and minimize the damage. Right. Can, can I just raise a quick point on that? Just a really practical one. Um, I used to work a lot in the identity access management space, single sign on, all that kind of stuff. And I remember working as a doctor, people would say to us, you know, power down the workstations. And in, in a, lot of, a lot of places, the workstations were so slow you would be the enemy of all your colleagues if you were the one who turned it off. And it's little things like that where security butts heads with usability that I think really needs to be um, figured out actually uh, uh, across the board because it's a great piece of advice from a security perspective. And then on the front line, no one wants to do that because it's, you know, it, you need the data when you need it and the fastest way is to keep everything on, right? So it's a really interesting challenge we face. Indeed, yes, in, indeed, it's it's all about compromise, right? But uh, and uh, and coordination. So, it's a great thank you, thank you very much for those uh, the tips uh, to uh, both of you, uh, both of you there. Um, I'd now like to open up to audience questions. We've got one uh, question in the Q and A box. Um, uh, please, uh, if anyone else has additional questions, please um, please uh, pump them in there. The first, this question is from uh, Mark uh, Broder, and I'm going to direct it initially to Tracy. Um, since she's uh, in, in, in the, uh, the hot seat here as the uh, Director of Clinical Engineering and uh, probably has the FDA on, uh, on speed dial on her cell phone, or maybe not, I don't know. But um, the question from Mark is, do manufacturers of medical devices have to comply with any specific medical device standards uh, that include cybersecurity minimal requirements? Is there any link between 6601-1 uh, and, uh, and any cybersecurity standard planned for the 2020 edition? So um, I, can, I can definitely kind of tackle the first part of it. The second part of it might be somebody up from one of our ACCE colleagues that um, can work on the and speak to the 2020 edition and kind of what's in the plan for that upcoming. But what you'll um, see in, in the FDA right now, yes, has started to come to come back around and say, hey, there, there's got to be cybersecurity, but you're finding it really at that the requiring manufacturers must address cybersecurity in both their pre and post market evaluations. But what you're not seeing yet is like defined standards um, that are telling you you have to, you know, meet X and Y and Z. Um, so it, it's there. There's, they're definitely have picked up on it. There's so much more information out there um, today than there has been. Um, but there's still, I think, a lot of um, openness about uh, what can and can't be done, I think, with, within the manufacturing world um, as they're putting this together. So again, they're, they're saying, yes, it's got to be there. They're saying that we want to be able to see it and see how you've addressed it. But kind of that qualitative um, piece of it about what has to be done is Think still got some room to go. Yeah, and this is very much a moving target, right? I mean, FDA has released pre and post market guidance uh, around the security of medical devices, and that continues to be revised and revisited um, <clears throat> and updated. Um, and we've also got um, a law going through uh, the US uh, federal government right now. I'm not sure if it'll make it through, hopefully, it will, um, about IoT security, right? For any IoT device that is used by um, any federal uh, government agency. And I'm sure that's gonna have uh, a knock-on effect to the healthcare IoT devices that, uh, you know, medical devices, uh, uh, you know, uh, contribute to. Um, Dr. Abed, um, I, I know this is an area that, you know, you and I have spoken about in the past, and, and obviously Europe has different standards, different bodies than the United States, and in some ways leads 
um, you know, leads to the US, certainly around privacy concerns. But what's, what's Europe doing and what are you seeing in this space? Yeah, I mean, so obviously the FDA had its premium post-market uh, guidance uh, in Europe. They looked at that quite a lot. And then they released what's been in the works for some time, the medical device regulations. That's been postponed just by a year um, in terms of, you know, really being enforceable um, because of the pandemic. But essentially, there's a whole separate document to that regulation that's all about cybersecurity. And actually, I'm very uh, happy about this overt clinical risk assessment as a part of cybersecurity. Now, you know, it's a, it's a 60 page document. No 60 page document is gonna cover every combination and permutation of how you can consider security, but there is this ramification that this can be used uh, as part of the regulation. If you're not compliant, you don't have your paperwork in order to demonstrate compliance, it can block you from selling potentially your goods in the European Union effectively, which is a pretty strong stick. Um, right frankly, commercially. Um, so I think that's interesting because I dare say that a lot of the manufacturers that my colleagues in US uh, healthcare organization will be dealing with will be selling internationally. So if they plan to still stay and uh, sell in Europe, they'll have this documentation ready, which comes back to a point as to even if there isn't a very detailed mandatory standard that you can look to, you can put it into your procurement requirements to ask for this documentation without saying, oh, from Europe. You can just say, I want your clinical risk assessment report. I want your blah, 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 blah. Whatever it is, use the language from uh, over here in Europe, put it in your procurement um, requirements. And if they've done it, which almost certainly they will have if they're you know international companies, um, then you'll have something to refer to. So that's, a, I wouldn't say it's a trick, but it's you know make, make the most of the work that they should have already been doing. Yeah. And this is, you know, yet another case of Europe um, legislating globally in many respects, right? Or regulating, not rather than legislating, uh, regulating uh, globally. You know, I mean, GDPR is now widely accepted as the international privacy standard, even though the U.S. has tried for 20 years to improve its its federal privacy legislation and uh, hasn't managed to accomplish it. I mean, certain states have uh, have introduced their own privacy legislation, <clears throat> but this could actually act, as you say, as a very good stick to the US-based manufacturing industry. And most medical devices are actually manufactured or designed um, in, in the US uh, that are sold globally. So this may, in fact, become a, a de facto global standard, as you suggest. And, and let's just be clear, there is a lot of alignment between what's happening in Europe and coordination with the, you know, at least some talk with the FDA. There is coordination. These aren't standards where if you look at the contents of them, you'll say, this is preposterous. How could they do this in Europe? It's right. stuff that's eminently sensible. Right, right. And I do like the idea about bringing it back and tying it back into the procurement because that that's on that's on you and available to do now. So while an individual hasn't done that, you could choose to do that for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, with any third-party vendor management um, solution where you're dealing with vendors, you know, to procure devices or to manage and service those devices, it makes uh, perfectly good sense to put in clauses in there to ensure that they are updating legacy devices or devices that may be installed in your facility to meet those, you know, standards as they move forward via patching and, and, uh, and, and updates. Alir, uh, since we've got you on the line here, are you aware of <clears throat> Uh, anything that uh, ACCE is doing or uh, how any insights into the 2020 edition of the 6601-1? Uh, so we don't, I don't have any insights on that. I know a bunch of members from ACC are uh, working uh, in, in help, have worked in helping with that. However, I don't have any insights on that at this point, but uh, uh, maybe I can reach out to uh, some members and send, uh, send something out after the webinar. Right. Okay. Yeah, that would be uh, most useful. Um, I think we've got like one minute left. So we've got one question that's come in from Mario Ramirez. Um, and I'm going to direct this to Pablo. Um, if an institution is hit by ransomware, is it safe to upload the most recent backup to bring systems back up online? <clears throat> uh, yeah, well, uh, the thing is, uh, it has to be uh, uh, an iterative uh, process. Uh, if an institution is hit by, a, by ransomware, there will be a lot of workstations are affected by this. Uh, so there will be a process where you will have to go um, one by one reviewing the uh, workstations 
and uh, powering on uh, things like uh, in different stages or whatever the plan you consider uh, fits best for your uh, infrastructure. The thing is that uh, you cannot, uh, for example, up upload a backup if everything's still on online uh, because they, they can still be there and if they see the backup, they will try to delete it uh, because it's, it's part of their um, their goal to make to make um, the situation um, impossible to restore the previous uh, things. Uh, so the thing is uh, how you uh, restore the backups and, and how you do this um, uh, process. Obviously, right. yeah, yeah, well, uh, Richard. Yeah, I was going to say, so, you know, typically in <clears throat> uh, in any um, security incident response, the backup, the restoring uh, of the backup is the most time consuming part, right? So, um, you know, it, it behooves us to make sure that the environment is clean and clear before undergoing that very time consuming process, because if you've left any inkling of the ransomware on your network, it's going to reinfect that backup and you're going to have to, to imp, you know, to... Uh, repeat that entire process. The criticality here is one of downtime and how that may potentially impact patient safety, right? And patient care. Um, the longer we are down, the more dangerous that becomes from a patient morbidity, patient mortality uh, perspective in our hospital. Uh, and this is really the driving factors for these things. I'm seeing a lot of hospitals look, instead of the traditional backup and recovery model, look at, you know, a uh, a warm backup or a you know a live a, a warm site that they can revert to in the event that their primary site um, goes down and uh, obviously that is a much more expensive uh, option but one that um, you know may be worth considering when you bear in mind the you know the costs reputational uh, patient safety costs and the uh, the costs of uh, restoration and recovery let alone the the downtime costs of of lost revenue so Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mario and, and to Mark for your questions. Uh, we will be posting these slides um, up to the ACCE uh, website. So you will be able to, uh, to uh, pull down uh, the data that uh, we shared with you all today. I'd like to thank um, all of the attendees uh, for sticking with us today. We had some fairly deep uh, and meaningful discussion around, you know, uh, around RIOC and ransomware and uh, you know, the impact of that from a clinical perspective and a clinical engineering perspective, and of course, obviously a cybersecurity perspective. Um, I'd like to thank um, our hosts at ACCE for uh, welcoming us here today. Uh, and in particular to my panelists, Dr. Saeed Abed of uh, the Abed Graham Group from London, um, Pablo uh, Rincon from the uh, Silera Labs uh, team in, in Madrid in Spain, and uh, last but not least to Tracy Hughes that lives and breathes um, the, uh, the concerns around uh, cybersecurity and clinical engineering on a daily basis at, uh, at Duke Health. So with that, I'd like to, uh, to thank you all again and uh, look forward to, uh, to the next time we're invited here to speak. Thank you now, bye-bye.